On today's show, Dan Tu can't wipe his own baby's ass. Or can the baby not wipe his ass? No, I think um, she can't wipe his ass with the baby's ass. Oh, we get an exclusive from Andy Farrell's 35-man squad with Baird, Connors, McCluskey. And skinny Roy Keane turns down the chance to live on Shrewsbury Lane with Barry. Shrewsbury Road. Road. <laughs> Joe presents Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby. Together with Guinness. Hello and you're very welcome to Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby here on Joe Together with Guinness. Spring brings changes on its wings Just on cue to lift my soul Happy faces come to sing Don't want to grow old Ever hoping to be free Filled with life's complexities Now dead summers come to call I'm going to really beat you and all Scene. <laughs> Do you like it? I, I loved it. It's yeah, lovely. That's my song for spring because I feel it's here. Is it an original? That is a Hermitage Green song. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> Live On, one of our first ever songs. Oh, wow. You can find that on YouTube or iTunes or all of the above. And uh, it has a lovely guitar riff in it as well. Quite a somber tone, though, for quite a should, what should be, despite coronavirus, an exciting time of year. Yeah, but it's, I just felt it with the sun this morning and I felt like just there is a change in the air. I also got new tackies, <laughs> and that is what spring has ultimately brought. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have heard so much about these tackies, and you and Earl are the only two people I know call them tackies. <laughs> <laughs> it's a limerick thing. I, like the coronavirus uh, virus, uh, it's, its reach is long and wide and far and wide, because I ordered these before Christmas, and uh -huh. uh, they didn't <clears> arrive, so I got on to Nike going, where are my... Runners, trim me. Nike are like, listen, we've got bigger fish to fry here. Yeah, well, they were We've got more important issues than your gutties. Yeah, they were <laughs> made in China. Your man on the phone was like, uh, these were made in China and the factory has to be closed down because of the coronavirus, so. Well, I paid good money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it shut me up fairly quickly. But so they arrived three months later. Very happy with them. Uh, they have on the back. <clears throat> Maybe. Oh, wow. They're my children's initials on the back. Oh, really? The on the right one, the AB, I thought, was the reaction whenever your dad um, caught you watching porn. Ah, bad. <laughs> <laughs> so it says an AB on the back, which is now a ah, bar. It was a ah, bar. <laughs> ah, bar. And then on the other one, it says, make the baby, because uh, I didn't want to just have M. So I said, make the baby. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's Very a good. bit douchey, but look, it's... Um, you had an option to put their full name on it, which I thought would be a bit too much with Annabelle yeah. on the back of them. Definitely don't do the full name. But I was thinking, right, it got me thinking about the names. When you're picking the baby's name, you're just picking this grand. But then um, picking a name for someone is so, it's a big deal, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and it's struck me now that like your name is so important, but it, it, can, uh, it can be ruined pretty quickly by someone else of the same name uh -huh. who does something. <laughs> Annabelle the murderous dog. The murderous dog. dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's a movie, so it's kind of, it's okay. It will it might be moved on. But like, let's say Harvey Weinstein, like uh -huh. imagine you were called Harvey Weinstein and you were just an accountant yeah. working somewhere and you're like, ah, or anyone called Harvey or anyone called Weinstein at the moment. Yeah. It's as bad as Hitler, like. Yeah. It's just like, that name is gone. No one is ever going to call their mm. child Harvey Weinstein now. No. 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 Well, no. I mean, maybe. Uh, no. Obviously, <laughs> no. But I mean, if there are Weinstein's already, then they're already kind of. It's in the family. Like, know. are they going to change their name away from Weinstein? That's what I wonder. How many people are like, "Geez, I'm going to Because imagine going to Starbucks now and be like, uh, "What's your name, Harvey?" Oh, no. so you're just going to go with Weinstein? Let me guess. But either way, yeah, they're kind of fucked. I was kind of trying trying to think this back to rugby. Then wasn't there Michael Jackson that played for Ulster? Was there? You play for Ulster? No, I thought that was Michael Jackson's the guy um, at Black Rock. Oh, yeah. He's um, Paddy's cousin. Yeah. He does a lot of after dinner speaking and stuff. Okay. He's hilarious. Is he? Yeah. Yeah, that that. I mean, he must find the name. He must use the name then. I'd say he? he does. He must get a bit of value. Although yeah. he he's had his name his whole life, and Michael Jackson's been big his whole life. But he was big, and he, was, he would have been using it differently. He'd yeah. Be like, yeah, yeah, Michael Jackson. Then it's like, oh shit. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like me and Fla passed the van on the road this morning. That was R. Kelly, uh -huh. and uh, it was R. Kelly's plumbing or something like that. And I was like, Jesus, I wonder how. Yeah. His, his, how's his business doing these days? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, because if it's a toss up between R. Kelly and well, unless there's a, unless the other plumbing business is Michael Jackson, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're grand. <laughs> like, might as well stick with R. Kelly. Yeah, you're you're all right. Yeah, Andrew Trimble. There's no, there's been no, there's no issues with Andrew Trimble. I was thinking about you. as like you're safe enough unless you, um, Andrew. Yeah. Pretty. There's no one that's. No, it's too. You, it's too. No, it's too normal. Unless you marry a princess, and you become <laughs> you Prince Andrew. Andrew. <laughs> So just stick with Anna. Don't well worry. Done. Well done. Well done. I also think Jack, uh, Jack Trimble, Jackie uh-huh. Trimble, your son. Uh-huh. That's quite a like a nineteen seventies soccer player, like Jackie Trimble. Jackie Trimble. Yeah. Ah, what a <laughs> yeah. girl from Jackie Trimble. Were there any of them had any um, uh, sexual allegations? Because uh, as long as there isn't them, I think he's grand. No, no, I don't know if Jackie Trimble was a soccer player, but it just sounds like. Yeah, I know. Yeah, like no, that's he, fine. He probably was back in the seventies. And then that got me thinking about the coronavirus because apparently Corona beer has suffered like 135 million drop in sales, um, which is insane. Yeah, well, I heard, yeah, I heard Corona dropped 8%. Yeah. Again, I don't know if that's the same, but uh, FTSE went down 9% in a week anyway, so everything's getting tanked. Yeah. But yeah, Corona's, the, the cor- corona's getting the blame. The Corona's the band. Like, I'm always wondering if people would stop. <laughs> Yeah, because people are that stupid that they go, I'm not going to go to Corona's case. Just in case. Just in case. Yeah, there's no diseases called Hermitage Green, thank God, <laughs> as of yet. <laughs> but there is going to be a big decision made today on whether the rest of the Guinness Six Nations goes ahead. Um, uh, who is having that meeting today, Pat? World Rugby. Yeah. World Rugby are stepping in. Um, so they definitely the Ireland Italy match call off this weekend. Uh, France, they've said that there's not going to be a gathering of over 5,000 people or more. Is that? I right? believe, yeah. Indoors, I think, is what they said. Yeah. Uh, oh, what a disaster. Yeah. So, uh, last time this happened, Pat, um, uh, they replayed, or as it, what was the outbreak? Was it? Uh, Foot them out, yeah. Um, what year, when was that? 2001. And then they replayed one of the games in like October before the November? Yeah. I think it was Ireland, Scotland, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, went, I went to that. Really? Yeah. I was 18, and myself and my mate f- uh, from college just had nothing to do with September, so college hadn't really kicked off properly yet. So we said we'd go, and uh, we were so broke that it was cheaper to go on the Thursday to the Tuesday. Do you know, if you fly on a Friday or a Saturday, f- flights are quite expensive. So if we went on the Thursday, flights were like 20 quid. So we went on a Thursday to Tuesday, and we stayed in a hostel for a tenner each, and uh, we would no money, so we just kind of ambled around town for a few days. But he hungry, <laughs> hungry. We we're eating Pizza Hut pizza and uh, just drinking cheap pints. But on the Saturday night, we met these American girls, right? A group of American girls after the match, and he fell madly in love with one of them, right? And then we went home and uh, went to bed. The next day, he had organised to meet up and go on a date with her um, and her friends. So I was like, "Where are we meeting them?" And uh, he said, uh, "At the ga- outside the Gap." And I was like. Okay, where's that? What do you mean? I said, I said, outside the gap. I said, where's that? And he goes, "Ah, it's it's downtown. Do you know below uh, Edinburgh Castle in Edinburgh, there's the big gap, the big gap in the ground. Uh, Yeah, the train station is right beside that, I think. Yeah, Yeah. there's a big hole, like a big gap valley. Uh, Yeah. And I was like, he's like, that's the gap. I was like, what? That's not the, surely she means the gap shop. And he's like, no, there's no gap in (laughs) Britain or Ireland. That's only in America. I was like, are you serious, man? And he, he was like, yeah, it's the big gap in the ground. That's what they call it. I said, fucking hell. He was so convinced that I was like, right. So we went down there and we, I was like, what? this thing's like a kilometre long. So I was like, where are we going to go? He said, just, oh, there's a middle part. So we picked the middle part. We just stood there. In the middle of the 12, gap. 12 o'clock in the middle of the gap waiting for these girls. <laughs> and uh, there was a, I remember there was a guy playing uh, bagpipes standing next to us. And he was just, <clears throat> baiting out the that Scottish tune, yeah, that the, gener- yeah, the generic, generic one, and then the Braveheart one. He had two songs. He was like the DJ and Father Ted, just yeah. like started again. I mean, he was getting awkward even looking at us because everyone else is kind of moving on quickly, but yeah. we were there for like two hours. And He's like, know. "Are you here to meet the Americans? <laughs> yeah. They're at the Gap in the shop." <laughs> 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 so they never showed up. I imagine it's like um, it's it's like the scene that uh, the Joker runs through after he um, after he uh, kills the bird. 
And he runs through and there's like homeless people on fires everywhere and you're looking for this date with these Americans. Mm. They're like, they're at the shop. They're man. at the gap, yeah. <laughs> so we did for two hours and eventually I was there. He got so ratty, he was like, fucking Americans. <laughs> and then we went walking around town, we got a bag of cans and we're walking around and then sure enough there was the gap shop, like smack bang in the middle of, of Edinburgh. And they were still waiting. <laughs> no, they were long gone. <laughs> uh, that's my one memory of the foot and mouth. Um, and Ireland got absolutely hammered that day as well. That sounds like a really depressing few days. It was, it was no, it was good. Yeah. It was good, it was good crack, <laughs> I think. Uh, just when you're that age, you don't really give a shit what you're doing. Um, so, yeah, look. So that, it's, it's weird, though, that I don't, I don't remember that at all. It's just totally disconnected from the rest of the Six Nations. Mm. It, it wasn't an important game, was it? Well, I think Ireland had done well in the Six Nations, and then I don't know whether they still had a chance of winning it. They could have finished second. It was a bit of a like there was a couple. A was do you think it was the only one that was left? I think there might have been a couple of matches left. No, um, I think no. I think that could have been it. Yeah, and then um, that was nearly spelt the end for Gatlin then as Ireland coach as well because yeah. they got hammered by the All Blacks then soon after. Like and then those okay. two bad defeats together, um, kind of nearly the end of the road from. So um, yeah, yeah, it, it was a bit of. I think that the. There's never been a championship not finished. I think that that was finished two thousand and one in nineteen seventy two. That was when uh, I think Scotland and Wales refused to play us. That was during the Troubles. Like, and England came over, kind of show us solidarity. Like, but mm. um, but yeah, it's it'll be interesting to see what happens. It's everything's changing day by day as well. So yeah, yeah, they're better off. Like, it's it's. I don't think they can. There's no argument. Just ditch it. Ditch the whole thing. Uh, for now, <clears throat> and then maybe yeah, have a look. They they kind of they're. They but have they, to play them. So, but yeah, but the the Italian games cancelled, obviously. But surely all the Italian supporters—that's the issue. The Italian supporters coming over, they're all still going to come over anyway. I would. Would you get in the plane if you were in a, in a, from coming from the north and knowing that the, it's an infected place and you, you you get on a plane, you're bound to pick up something, you know, sooner than if you were just sitting at home. Yeah, but the the Italians coming over, I think, because they feel they are the infected place. They've got. <laughs> They've got we might as well have it. We have it anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're like, well, listen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's still no. There's no. Tra- you're like. You're right. Because there's no travel restrictions yet. So yeah. we're not stopping anybody from. Italy. And and sorry. And more generally, then just people are traveling all yeah. the time anyway. Mm. Yeah. So the the like the games. Like, I'm not saying it's the least of our worries, but it's only one of our worries. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I wouldn't travel if I was an Italian supporter. I'd be like, nah, better off. You just sit there. Sniffing, being sick, blowing your nose. Fuck, I'm wiping the sanitizer my f- my hands constantly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> will we get out our uh, scientific coronavirus expert, <laughs> Jerry Flannery? Yeah. Uh, I believe he has a PhD in it. Uh, we also have to talk about um, the weekend's Pro 14 action, and we'll look ahead to the games that are going ahead next weekend, um, as you know, as of yet, been cancelled. So, yeah, let's um, let's get flout. Okay, welcome to the welcome to the show, Fla. How are you, lads? Um, the currently in June, the European Championships are on in June in Ireland. Um, the Guinness Pro 14 finishes on June twentieth. There's matches in the Aviva on the fifteenth, nineteenth, twenty fourth, and thirtieth. The game must be held in Lansdowne Road if Ireland, Italy is the only one that's cancelled. It must go ahead in Lansdowne Road. So the only available date left is June 27th, which actually wouldn't be bad because they're heading to Australia the following week for a tour. So it'd be like a, yeah, be a warm-up a game. Warm up game. <coughs> so that's fine as long as it's the only one that's yeah, cancelled, yeah. though. Yeah, as long as it's uh, exactly as you're right, Trimby. Yeah. But if they cancel more, it's just going to be a backlog, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, particularly in a, it, the worst time in a World Cup year as well, when the, there's already a lot of congestion in the in the season. Yeah, it's a long season, isn't it? June twentieth. <clears throat> mm. um, yeah, look, it's it's. Uh, I can't see it happening. <clears throat> Maybe October. Um, that could be, you know, potentially an option as well. As in wrap it round into when they would have the you normally yeah. have say November series. Mm. Yeah, potentially. That's what it. That's what it is in the past. But it's just it's it. It's kind of an anticlimax, isn't it? Really, mm. um, that game isn't isn't really going to be that important anyway. I suppose as long as there's no more games, if like the the France Ireland game the week after, 
could, you know, could be could be big, could be yeah, a player. Yeah. Um, if that was to be, if that was to be played then, and then <laughs> like someone was crowned champions of the six, the 2026 Nations in November, mm. then that would be <clears throat> okay. Don't worry about it because the next Six Nations is only a couple of months away. Mm. Yeah, it'll be then. That'll be weird. Sure, what? there's nothing you can do, man. It's the the virus is. Mm. But surely the virus will still be <clears throat> raging by October, will it not? I, I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I hope, hopefully not. I, sorry, I thought you. I thought you <laughs> sorry, were, I yeah, my role, my role in the show as a scientist. <laughs> um, yeah, they just gotta, they just gotta find a place to play it. And I think you're contractually obliged to talk rugby, and when there's no rugby, you talk um, viruses. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, <laughs> I didn't yeah. do my homework on it, so. Uh, if um, it's it's they're contractually contractually. Uh, What's the word I'm trying to say? Obliged? <laughs> Oblo- con- no, don't, no, I can't even get through contract. <laughs> <laughs> don't even get me started on obliged. Uh, contractually obliged by sponsorship to play them, right? Because if you're, if you're a player and if you're the RFU, maybe not the RFU because they want, uh, uh, they probably want the gate. But if you're a player and a coach, you're kind of like, let's just move on, right? Yeah, but it's, um, it's, um, there's a lot of cash in it for the RFU. Mm. It's more than they're contrarily obliged. They want to play it because there's a lot of revenue in it for them. Mm. And players want to play as well. It's a chance to play international rugby. In October, November, like you would, you, they would still... Yeah, I'd be keen. They'd be up for it. Yeah, I think so, Trimby. Yeah, yeah. But well, even it's if it's not, a dead duck, yeah. you know, if, let's say, it goes on now and France win the, the Grand Slam and um, even if Ireland end up playing the last two games and they've, they've not to play, like, what what's the? It's I can see I can see players being more reluctant if there's four internationals in November. Pat, is there? Just three. Ireland just have three. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. even that, I suppose, even say if this France and Italy, if they're both put on at the front at the start of November, mm. five internationals in a, in in a row, five weeks in a row, guys would be reluctant. I'd, I'd say, be a heavy old workload, wouldn't it? Yeah, but sure, they can surely. It's all hypothetical, obviously. We don't yeah, think. yeah. The 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 players are there now that they can. They can split that game time up. Yeah. Look at all the lads that stood out over the weekend, all these young guys, you know. Yeah. It's an opportunity to, for them to play. Are we get yeah. into that? Let's. Um, Ryan Baird, I suppose, the, the first and foremost. Um, hat for trick. an old didn't he? Hat trick after 60 minutes. Um, I was saying to Flan the way up, his physique is like, it's so, he, his back is like that wide, his arms like flat compared him to Retallick for New Zealand. He's got, Big long arms, big stride. Um, you know, as much as James Ryan is a is an animal and the phenom we were calling him before, and a big guy, Baird is even more impressive as an athlete. Yeah. Um, what is he still twenty years of age? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's yeah. been talked about for a few years now. That definitely over it, probably a couple of years people have been talking about him mm-hmm. and saying he's going to be the next James Ryan or mm-hmm. uh, if he, he is, if he's anything like James Ryan and he looks like he's got something special about mm-hmm. him. Then you've got two of the like. If if he gets to the level that James Ryan's at, obviously he's got a lot of work to do between now and then. Mm. But that's a ridiculous second row yeah. uh, combination. Isn't it? You've uh, been you watch him the world. Watch you know. him at the World Cup and his 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 ability to offload. He's got like you said, we've got the long levers, I and mean, you could see when he when he made the break for his for his try, you could see that real high knee lift when he was yeah. running. He's a real athlete, and I watch him under twenty level, and he's really comfortable on the ball. You know, you watch a, a lot of Kiwi forwards, and they just look comfortable when they're running at full mm. speed with the ball. And uh, I think, like, if you're looking, if you're looking at, at the depth chart for Leinster going down, there's only a couple of positions where they're probably, you know, looking a little bit like light, and down the line, I suppose, with Scott Fardy and Dave Toner's age profile, like Baird coming in there is just, you know, Baird coming in mm. like him and James Ryan. Now, whether he's going to be a six or whether he's going to be in the row, but like when you get a guy and you pick a guy in the second row. And he can score a hat trick for you like that. He's played six a lot as well, has he? I think he's played six <coughs> as well, yeah. So a lot of chat last week after the English match was <coughs> Itoji, obviously, and how much damage he was doing mm. uh, defensively. Just and he's kind of a similar build, um, long limbs and, and gets in the way and just pulling and dragging. And um, a lot of times, like we don't have players like that in Ireland. And you know, that's well, I've heard a lot of pundits saying that, but. There is one clear example of a guy we have. Um, Itoje was fast tracked straight into the English setup. I think the year after playing twenties, um, you know, is that is that what a guy like that is what you need? Just throw him straight in there. 
Um, I think I think Baird seems to be more of an attacking player, like less of I think Atoja is very very destructive and and disrupts an awful lot. I think Baird has his his upside is more on the attack side of things, what he can do. I'm not saying he can't do the other side, but um, but look, I think but getting him in, getting him the exposure yeah, early absolutely. on, absolutely. Like, Play him as same thing as they possible. did with um, Will Connors, Balakun, Ronan Kelleher. Mm. Who was the other one? There was another. There was four of them. <clears throat> They named their squad and then they mm. named four development players. Like mm. he would be a guy, be a good contender for that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> um, the sooner he gets, he's obviously getting exposure to Dev already. The sooner he gets more exposure to the international setup and what's required, stepping up to that level, then the easier it'll be for him to do that when he gets his chance. Oh man, he was outstanding at the weekend. Yeah. Le- Leinster are, are, were outstanding. Um, mm. You know, if you if you went through the, the the Pro 14 last year and you were looking at like the strongest sides there. Glasgow would have been one of the strongest sides, and like fifteen internationals as well. Yeah, this weekend. and for for Leinster to put like fifty points in them, man, it's crazy, yeah. you know. Um, and Leinster looked comfortable all the way through it. Like I, I was incredibly impressed with Leinster's defence and how they very, very rarely burn two in the tackle. They'll always like, and Will Connor is a real good example of like coming in with a dominant chop every single time, and the other players around him like. Even if it's not a dominant chop, if it's just a two-man double where two guys are coming in, like if it's it's if it's in heavy traffic and they're coming in high, the second man will always will, will bounce out unless the, unless there's a real opportunity to add time to the ball. I see the second guy always bouncing out. So Leinster are just committing one into the tackle, or else if they commit two, they're adding significant time, so that they they're giving their defence an op- an opportunity to get set, or else they're turning the ball over. Mm. Uh, it's it's and and against teams like Glasgow that are going to play from everywhere, you know it's so important that you're just keeping bodies <coughs> on the on mm. the like defense is basically winning the numbers game. How many how many numbers do you have in your defensive line versus how many attackers they have? Leinster is so good at that. Yeah, so they kind of the Glasgow start from the get go were were trying to run the ball even though they had a big win in the first half. Um, yeah, I didn't even know. I mean, after a game like that, all you focus on is Leinster's attack. From my point of view, I was just so blown away, but. In hindsight, thinking back, yeah, you're right. They, that, I mean, they did one try that the one down the left hand side that kind of came from a, a ball that's spat out of the rock a little bit. So he's kind of is it Kyle Stain? Yeah, Stain's try. They, that, and they actually lost mm. two players in a in in a tackle in that one because two guys came in. I wasn't sure it was, it was on the short side. Two guys came in and both engaged, and the ball kind of almost bobbled out, and just two passes, and Stain got away. Mm. But. Uh, it, apart from that, it's very rare to see them like uh, losing two bodies in the tackle, and that's why their defence. Mm. I think they're averaging around thirteen point five, thirteen and a half points a game. That, that's all they're conceding. It's phenomenal. Yeah, and then obviously attack wise, putting fifty nine points on one of the best teams in the league as well. Um, <clears throat> they again, they just well, we've said it so many times: tempo, ability to create quick ball, and then the variety of play. Um, like in one phase of play, you'll see, and it doesn't seem to be. A, uh, you know, a prescribed plat or a pattern they're playing. It'd be a pick and go. Uh, Luke McGrath will take a short runner, then he'll go to ten, and ten will have someone out the back. He'll have he'll have someone on his inside. He'll have seven or eight different variety of play that just happen like like that, like that. Every time McGrath has the ball, he's got different options all around him. Like when you said last week, when there was a good point when uh, if you took a screen grab of the Irish setup last week, Murray would have one option mm-hmm. all the time. That was it, to go to 10, and it was uh, pretty easy to see what they're doing. So you watch someone like Leinster, and even when they get slow ball, after a couple of phases, they can still recreate quick ball with, with, a, with a variety of play, and they just, guys seem to know the role, like Joe Tamani, how good is he? Yeah. Come as a signing for them, like just mm. uh, taking the right option. James Lowe coming in off his wing, far, you know, farty <coughs> hands out wide, they're just so slick to watch. Um, Could be the emphasis on uh, on phase play and unstructured kind of starting, just starting phase play off, just throw the ball in. It sounds like um, Lancaster that he puts a bit of an emphasis on that. Whereas the shift is from from Schmidt's emphasis, which was set piece starters, mm. rest- uh, maybe uh, maybe restarts, but everything came from somewhere. And there was there was a bit of emphasis on phase play, but that seems to have been changed quite a bit. That's a big change, I think. Mm. They just look so calm. They, they put the ball anywhere, everybody will get into their shape and they've just got two or three different options and they seem to communicate really well. They, they all know where everybody's supposed to be. Oh no, They know what options there are. It's all options on. They just look very composed. 
Mm. Oh, you're, you're right, Trimby, because if you look at it, if all you're focusing on is the starter play, and, and, and if you're focusing on that, then it's only the players who are doing the starting play, starter play that are actually, you know, that are actually getting, getting the reps in there. But when you're focusing on unstructured and you can let it play, you could have, you could have three teams of 12 all working against each other, all working, you know, work, two teams of 12 working against each other and then rotate it that someone else comes in. And if it's all unstructured, everyone is working on their decision-making and attack and defence all the time. That's what you were saying, Baz. And uh, listened, I listened to Lancaster, some of his podcasts, and he was talking about that's how they structure their sessions. And it seems to be, that's why it's not, it's not down to one or two players there. Everyone just seems so comfortable. Mm. Uh, and then the other thing Scott Farley said actually um, a couple of weeks ago was the young fellas they step up because they've got they've all got um, Ryan Baird's got Dev to look up to or Scott Farley mm. um, all all the tens Ross Byrne less so but Harry Byrne and um, Kieran Frawley both of Johnny to look up to and they all like, as much they're just getting such good influences from a, a young age you know they're coming in as nineteen year olds getting great and it, like a one on one kind of time with Johnny. And seeing the way he gets on in the team environment, and Scott Farley was saying someone like Frawley just dominates the team whenever he's he's ten. Mm. Just dominates the the team meetings and takes everything. And you know that that's that the the rich get richer. You know if you're in that environment, you'll continue to learn, and then the young fellas get better, and then the young fellas again get better. Um, so they're untouchable. I, I I can't see this ever end in the Leinster. They're just untouchable at the minute. March and they've to lose a game. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Liverpool last the weekend. It was kind of up for two. And who's gonna, who's gonna break first? Liverpool yeah. gonna hide. Um, but that's irrele- actually Pat. I really enjoyed your piece on Roy Keane uh, <laughs> yeah. at the weekend, who had a go off David De Hoya and um, Pickford, Pickford yeah. for yeah. their yeah. terrible goalkeeping. Uh, Keane is a maniac man. He was like, he's he's not a good goalkeeper. And, like, he's just not a good goalkeeper. And Graham Soon is like, he's the English goalkeeper. And he's like, he's not a good goalkeeper. I was like, fuck, he doesn't take any prisoners, man. He's uh, did he he's back vicious. it up though, or did he give a reason, or did oh, he? Oh, he he was he, he makes a lot of mistakes. I think there was you a know? great line that he said. Uh, the 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 guy says, uh, I think David Jones is the guy, but he was saying. Uh, but there was a lot of dip on that Bruno Fernandez shot, like it really was moving. And Keane goes, "Of course it was moving. Somebody kicked it." <laughs> <laughs> but he does, and he's yeah. given out about like how late they are. He's almost like the goalkeeper shown off, not yeah. not diving early. He's like, "Ah, I'll get to it," and then he misses it. Like, you know, it's like such arrogance. But uh, he's a terrifying man. <laughs> um, I do you remember he came into us mm. back? We played against Sale in. 2005, I think, in Manchester. Sh- uh, was that when you um, you targeted Shabal? That was the ho- this was the ho- the uh-huh. away match, yeah. the first one, and uh, Kidney brought Roy Keane in on the Friday night. Mm. And we were we were all in the team room. It was a surprise. He came in to talk to us, and uh, we were all eating pizzas and stuff, weren't they? Were we? Uh, Might have been just a too. terrible example of how uh, we should prepare in front of someone like him. And uh, when I think back, he, he gave us a chat. We were in the middle of playing a game of Monopoly. And uh, I've had one interaction with Roy Keane my entire life, and this was it. And I'll often be just sitting somewhere, uh, just at home, next to my wife and family, and I'll just go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it was 14 years ago. It's like, oh, fuck. So we were playing, uh, we were playing Monopoly, and like, I was playing with, with Freddie Pucciarello and Dowling, I think, and um, he... He started talk. He came in and the game had to stop, and he started talking about everything and anything. And someone asked him about anything he does outside of rugby, and he said, "I ah, does a little bit with the guide dogs and stuff." And I think John Kelly asked him about, "Did he ever get into investment and property?" And he said, "Ah, maybe a little bit." And I was like, "Any interest in uh, buying Shrewsbury Road?" <laughs> oh, you go. <laughs> and he just goes, "No." Like that, and then that was it. Like it was. Horrendous, man. Oh no! Like, should all you've one opportunity to say something to, um, but yeah, <laughs> he's a tough crowd though. He is, man. Yeah, he's. Like, more, when you throw that out, more more often than not, that'll be good. That'll be well received from you. He he's even called me a go. Because <laughs> you were kind of representing us. Like I remember he walked in and he was like looking around at us, and there's like pizzas everywhere, and we're all like these. 
he was t- I don't remember how small he was, man. He yeah. was so small. And we were all like these fat rugby players. I was like, oh, man, he must be looking at us like we're idiots. <laughs> Should have asked him about that. What's it like being so small, Roy? <laughs> he, he, was like, he was saying, like, he's, do you remember he said, like, I stopped eating meat and all that. And he said, like, I, he said, what did he say? His, he said, oh, the, the, the dietitian in our, the nutritionist in, in, in United came in and, you know, said his body fat was a bit too high and then he went completely the opposite, like, and he became ins- obsessed with his diet and said he got, like, unbelievably, because he, he was he was taking a piss out of himself, saying, like, oh, as you can see now, I'm, I'm, I'm massive. Like, he was joking because he looked so small. And then Baz did that joke and we're all like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah, terrible. And <coughs> Dowling came out with something worse. Asked him as himself and Patrick Vieira, still good pals or something. And that, that kind of saved me a little bit because it was even worse. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think Paulie definitely took on a lot of what what he was saying, wasn't he? Because I think everyone used to call Paulie Kino after that. He's got even more. He's called him psycho, psycho anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah well, he's he was kind of like a he was kind of like a guy who was setting the standard, wasn't he, for what what Irish sports people could do abroad and constantly demanding more, and that's why everyone looked up to him at such all, mm-hmm. and. <clears throat> He's still a massive personality now on the TV. I wonder, I wonder, does he does he ham stuff up a little bit when he's on TV, or is that is that genuinely him? I I, I yeah, don't know. I wonder what he's like behind behind the scenes. I wonder yeah. is he lovely? <laughs> 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 no, like a lot of players have come out and, uh, and trashed him. Like anyone that's work, not anyone, but a lot of players that have come out and worked him saying he's very difficult to work with. He's very hard on him, but. Again, it's it's standards, isn't it? You'd wonder, like it's for this generation, maybe it mightn't be, might work as a coach, but you'd wonder, will it swing back that way again? I don't know. I don't know. It'd uh, be quite tiring, being around someone like that the whole time. Mm. Quite intense. Mm. If you're winning, you don't mind. Yeah. You'd mind less. Anyway. Yeah, I remember talking mm. about Alfie in Gahaland, like where he ended his career, like, and he was, he was like. Yeah, I did it, you know, like what, like that kind of yeah. violence that you don't see mm. on the pitch anymore. You do. We you see the Scarlet, the, the Scarlet, yes. Scarlet's yes. monster again. Uh, that was gold. Um, <laughs> Poor JJ. Poor JJ. Yeah. He's minding his own business, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like a punch to the throat, kind of, wasn't it? The yeah, side it was of his some... neck, was it? Yeah, it was like, yeah. JJ was kind of like, what, 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 what did you just do? Did you just punch me? Yeah, yeah. JJ took it well. I know it yeah. didn't really land, but he still took it well. And then it's like your man went, oh, no, that's so embarrassing. I'm going to get a red for that. Yeah. And he goes, right, may as well. Go again. <laughs> Take, it, was witch, it was witchly, wasn't it? Mm. Straight on the nose. He I mean, took it well, too, actually. Like, such a t- sign of the times. Like there was a, I watched the Caribou Cup final, sorry to go back to football yesterday, but there was a, a hard enough challenge, and it was like, oh, it would have been nothing 10 years ago, but it was a yellow card. It could have been a red card. It was crazy. But it was a, he won the ball, but it was just because it was a hard tackle. Um, that everyone was saying you can't do that anymore, and then when that happened yesterday, like that was like pfft, there was uproar in the in the in the monster match on Saturday. Whereas that was run of the mill a while back, wasn't it? Was it? He he did he did yeah. throw a pretty blatant punch. Yeah. A very very poor blatant I, punch, and yeah. then threw another one. So I think I think you you nearly need to be sent off for that, man. You it know wasn't I mean? like you mean when we were like to, like. 15 years ago, yeah. when we were starting out. Yeah. I think it was slightly more common, but mm. it still would have been an Red actual card, punch. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, But even like probably 10 years, 15 years before that, I'd say it was... Mm. I, and another sign of the times, I was kind of hoping someone would come up and pull his rat's tail. JJ might be, yeah, pulling his rat's tail a little bit. Like, uh, it's the second, second week in a row. It's kind of, it's <clears throat> I think the, the conditions wrecked the game. The conditions wrecked the game. But yeah. I think... I thought, you know, stood out like was Kevin O'Byrne to me. I thought like Kevin O'Byrne is probably. I thought we were still talking fighting. Oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay, I go back, back to second week in a row, and I was thinking, hey, did someone get uh, punched last week? No, the zebra, the zebra winger Bruno got sent off for leading with a forearm. Yeah, mm. and yeah, my, um, Peter Dog got sent off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just you just can't do it now, man. Yeah. You know, mm. you see that a lot still, and it doesn't get picked up. I'm quite wary of that now, the forearm thing. Because um, it is, it's fucking dangerous. Like. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I am glad they're clamping down on that. Yeah. It's, um, but but it, it, what's your favourite fight ever? 
Do you want to buy time? I'll, I'll tell you what mine is. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, O'Connell and Codmore. Mm. Uh, That's the one that just pops into my head straight it's, away. It's, it's one of the best ever. It was two heavyweights. Like. Yes, it was class. And it just it looked like um, Codmore um, just he went on the pitch intending at some stage I'm going to get into a row with O'Connell. Just, just picking on the biggest fella, you know, like as if you're mm. arriving in prison or something, you know, make a name for yourself. And then, I, from what I remember, maybe I remember this incorrectly, but Codmore was punching him in the process of punching him like two or three times, and Paulie was like this, like <laughs> getting punched whilst appealing to the the touch judge. Uh, yeah, isn't that right? He got he took two or three digs before he then got stuck in. Then got stuck in, and there therefore he got a Codmore got a red, and yeah. O'Connell got a yellow. Yeah, mm. clever. Man. I'm going to hit you, like, but I'll wait till I get you on the ground until it's a little bit more of a defence thing as opposed to standing there just punching someone in the face. Like. Yeah. Still, probably O'Connell's yellow was harsh then. Still throw digs, I suppose. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I have to, to defend speak. myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, because he came up and his nose was bust up, it wasn't near his teeth. Yeah. Um, but I think he kind of got the better of him in the end, didn't he, Paulie? Cutmore's like a fucking WWE wrestler, like. He's what? He's like a WWE wrestler. <laughs> yeah. Hey, this reminds me of. Was his brother a wrestler or something like that? Did he? Did no, he was it? there a. Someone was, someone was a debt collector at some stage. A or debt a, collector? A bailiff or a debt collector. One of his brothers. <sighs> no, we play, man, we played, against, we played against Canada and his bro- sitting beside his brother. His brother had a little mustache. Uh-huh. And he was like, oh, I'm Jamie Cudmore's brother. I was like, oh, yeah, nice to meet you. But he was like, he was real small compared to. Uh-huh. Compared to Cudmore, but I think either Cudmore was I think Cudmore might have might have might have been a debt collector Definitely. or a bailiff or something like that. I could be wrong, hmm. but uh, yeah, he was hard. He was hmm. a hard player. Yeah. But like it's a pretty stupid man doing that. In like he just got sent off. Like O'Connell was was sharp with it. Like in terms of like looking at the looking at the touch judge and going like this guy's throwing punches and hmm. then was able to mail into him then. Yeah. So that but, uh, that Clermont team were unbelievable. Like hmm. um, it, even though they were down fourteen men, it took. Hmm. I think Nile Rowland scored two wonder tries that night to mm. kind of got us to win it in very late. But um, they were, you know, that was I, I remember feeling like fuck this team are the best team we played against. Yeah, and then you watch them this year against Ulster, man, and you go, well, where are they now? You know what I mean? Oh, I don't in, in Belfast. They're yeah, terrible, yeah, they were terrible. But they're handy over there, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Their their, their form's been up and down all year. Mm. But uh, they seem to be one of the clubs that seems to have more of a a European, impl- or not European, more of a Anglo-Saxon influence. Mm-hmm. Is Anglo-Saxon, is that the right word? They're less, they, they're yeah. less French. They had, um, they're they had less Schmitt. French. They had Schmidt in as well. As yeah, yeah. yeah. Schmidt, Schmidt and Vern Connor, yeah. He was yeah. a coach that year. But they just had him back <coughs> in there. Oh, they, yeah. As a consultant, yeah. Wow. And they beat Agen away, hmm. apparently. Yeah. Not sure was hanging his whistle up. Not a whole. <laughs> yeah. The thing about the, the like the French, the skill set that the players have, the individuals have, is 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 incredible. It's just if they're always playing, if that's all they ever play against when they're in France, then you know it's whoever's got the best, whoever plays that style of rugby the best will win. But I've started to see now, like teams like Cast from a few years ago and Leon playing more, of, focusing more on the kicking game and bringing in structure and getting a lot of return from it. You know. Um, but That's a really good point. I was thinking about this. Like when a lot of people talk of French flair and the rugby, they 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 kind of talk about as if that they don't have a lot of uh, that they're not uh, st- organized enough or, or not even organized. Like um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Dogged enough or rough or tough enough? But like French rugby is tough, man. It mm. always has been tough. It's the lack of organisation that they have. You know, when they're kind of go, everyone's putting so much emphasis on uh, on Sean Edwards now, and he's getting them really riled up and stuff. It's I don't think it. That's what it is. I think it's the organisation. Yeah, having a yeah. kicking game and having them organised. Instead of having fifteen individuals on the field, mm. it's or just roughly organising those individuals. Like unstructured, like you, everyone knows when it, when the game goes unstructured, France or they come alive and they're brilliant. I think it's just making sure that they're they're all fit. And then giving them a rough roadmap that all the players can work to, because you don't want to take away what they're best at, but you can't go on and only be good in unstructured rugby. Because if the weather is bad, or if you know if if, if a team is is is, is going to play is focuses hard in the kicking game, you need to be able to manage that. Um, so I think that's why 
some of the coaches that have gone across there, like like Joe, and have had an influence in 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 places like like Claremont, they're still they're they're very competitive then at European level then. Mm. Um, it's hard to. Uh, I, I remember I uh, was chatting to, whenever I was um, finishing up, it turned out my back was hanging off me, so I couldn't. I was got, I was considering going and playing uh, a year in the second division in France, and uh, and I chatted to Louis Ludic because he played a year, a couple of years at Agen, mm -hmm. and went really well, and then kind of made his way over to to Ulster, and him and his wife loved their time in France, so I was asking him about, it and he was saying, uh, he was he was saying. You need to go over and you need to embrace the way they do things. Mm. But he said, do not try to change them. You know, because he knew that I, 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 I like to play rugby. I like to be in an environment with, with Joe where things are organized and structured and um, everybody kind of is pragmatic and planned. So I, that's what I, I like. That's the way I like to play, play rugby. That always got the best out of me. And then Louis was like, no, don't try and change the way mm. they do things because you'll never change. Mm. You know, whereas someone like Joe... Who's very obviously exactly that style. He's he got massive success with, with Claremont. John mm. Gibbs is is a similar style with a slightly more appreciation of, of kind of French. I remember him saying before, one time he was saying about Claremont how he said you knew how they were going to perform by just the atmosphere and the, the buzz and the, you know what the crack or whatever it was was in the team. There was just an atmosphere where you knew they were going to perform or not perform. So he had slightly more of that appreciation, but. It's, I, I, I find it really. I find French rugby so fascinating because they've got so much potential, but they just do so much stupid stuff, and they're so disorganised. Mm. Even against uh, Wales, obviously a big game, France away to Wales a couple of weekends ago, um, but there was about a ten or fifteen minute period where Wales put had them on the ropes, and they started doing what they do best: just giving away stupid penalties, making stupid decisions, mm. talking back to the referee. Uh, you know, we're the victims. And then they were under under the pump for, for a while. Yeah. And I just see they just go back to that every now and again. That's why I remember we were saying before the World Cup, France are back. <laughs> and then the next weekend they get hammered. Hammered by Scotland. I was like, no, they're not. Yeah, but like we all love <laughs> French the way proper mm. French rugby's played. Toulouse, like in around kind of two thousand seven to two thousand ten, you know, the, the way they play is class. It's incredible to watch. And we all would love to, for them to get back to that, but they won't get back to that unless they continue, as they look to be doing. They could win the Grand Slam this year, obviously, but um, it's it's someone like Sean Edwards. I'm surprised that he's had such a big effect because, as you say, he's the guy who brings in a um, get the boys off for the game, get them psyched up, get them off the line, smashing boys. But there must be a lot of detail in what he says as well, mm. because that's the bit that counts. That's the bit that France needs, mm. I think. Yeah. Does this make sense? Their tackle entry looks is night and day to what it is before. Like the players, their body position as they're entering into a tackle now, and how many dominant tackles they're making, and they seem to be aggressive getting off the line. So you can definitely see that they've been coached in that area and they've taken it on board, which is testament to the players as well. You know, yeah. coachability is 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 a, is a talent. To Jer have. Jeremy Davison's another one with, with Ulster, and he's got he's had massive success with uh, Aureliac in Pro de Deux, and then now with Breve. And uh, and he's mad. Some of the stuff he's he's got he's had an ACL reconstruction before they um, perfected the the procedure. Right. right. So he's got a massive scar down his knee and it hardly bends. Like he's, his he legs got, are so long. Man. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so he's he limps the whole time. Yeah. But doesn't stop him counter rocking when he's a coach <laughs> in, <laughs> in <laughs> sessions. <laughs> Comes flying in from the side and he's like, "That'll happen at the weekend, lads." Yeah. So you're going. Did he coach? Did he coach you at yeah, Ulster? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's mad. He's was he a forwards coach? Yeah, yeah. She's and mad. then I heard stories about him at Aureliac um, because like, um, get your friend, get your pack up for the game, get them psyched up. I remember here at one stage, they were doing a, um, they were scrummaging his machine, and Jeremy was standing on top of the scrum. I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like not on the scrum machine, on the scrum, yeah, yeah, on yeah. the boys' backs. Just making sure that they've all got flat backs and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. What? I'm not sure. It's been 120 kgs, man. Yeah. No, Jesus. I'm not sure if it was for the technical reason no. or the let's just get these boys up for it. Mm. I don't yeah. know, but well, whatever works. Whatever but it's works. worked unbelievably well for him. Yeah. He's been flying. You'd wonder is it, is it the new generation of French players and those younger lads are they a little bit more professional than um, you know? Dan Tui retired last week, and I saw a few things he said. <clears throat> Again, it's that 
uh, stereotypical thing we hear about anyone that comes from here and goes over there and they're just, and they don't train, there's lads taking breaks during weight sessions to go out and smoke fags and they're yeah. coming in, they're stinking of fags and they're uh, drinking during the week and uh, it's just so loose and like, as Louis said to you, don't try and change it, that's the way it is. Yeah. Um, but that can't, you know, as an organisation, that can't last, surely. So now you'd, you'd think that a, the younger players coming through that it's maybe they've, they've taken a little bit more of a professional view in it. Yeah, maybe. Mm. But and to Mark in particular, looks like he 24 7 should have a cigarette in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> it just, it, he doesn't look like he doesn't smoke. Yeah. I don't know. I've never heard anything about him smoking, but I'd be very surprised if that fellow doesn't smoke. Yeah. Half time, yeah. I've never seen a man shoot a cigarette more. Yeah, just the whiskey at half time. Yeah. Yeah. Harry, um, yeah. as you guys were talking there, they, Ireland announced a 35 man squad for, like, assuming this France game is going ahead. They're all going to meet up anyway for training this week, but mm -hmm. uh, the big one actually is Baird is in it. And oh. Not a development player, he's just in the main squad. Oh. Anyone left out? Baird was in originally, wasn't he? Is it development, a development player? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. He, was. you were mentioning who else was in. He was, was yeah, Tom O'Toole was the other one I forgot. And mm. then who, Harry Byrne was in as a development player as oh, well. Uh, but, as well. So yeah, he's in the main squad now, and um, yeah, pretty much everybody else who you'd expect. Uh, Jack O'Donoghue's back in. Um, Dave Kearney's in again. He scored was 14 tries now in the Pro mm. 14. McCloskey's back in. And then all, all the regulars as well, Billy Burns, Will, Will Connors is in as well. Um, so that's the big one, yeah. As a so, development? Uh, no, they're no. all, this is just, yeah, straight up. So it, the, yeah. there must be, like, there's a few out, obviously, with injury um, um, after last week, but they must have dropped, no, did, did they drop anyone? No, because yeah. it's like a 35-man squad, okay, so you right. can pretty much have everybody. They said even Delan and Dave Heffernan, when they get back from South Africa, are going to link up with them as well. Well, so every yeah everybody's in, but just yeah, the Baird, Baird, I suppose, and Will Connors are the the big the main one because they're part of the main squad now. Exciting! I thought Craig Casey was unreal for Munster at the weekend. Again. Yeah, I thought he was brilliant. Brilliant! Like I, Kevin O'Byrne had a great game, and I'm a massive fan. His little uh, tip-ons and and his skill has been it's moments of skill he's shown this season have been unreal. But I thought Craig should be man of the match the weekend. You've been talking with him for a while. Yeah, and. I just haven't really haven't really spotted it. Yeah. And then at the weekend, he just looked like... I remember you saying before, there was one game that looked like Munster were kind of just taking a little bit of a beating. Mm. And they needed someone like Craig Casey. He was against Leinster before Christmas. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I could see it. I could see exactly what you meant there. Mm. He looks like feisty, fired up. Mm. He looks like someone who's a bit of a leader. Mm. Like his class. Yeah, he's like... <coughs> every kick he had, I felt, got a return. That we... That, you know, a positive return. His passing was flawless in a game like that where um, obviously conditions aren't great and uh, new combinations all over the pitch as well and he's still just zipping the right pass. Uh, me and Flower talking on the way up and uh, we were talking about how he sometimes he doesn't make the right decision but he'll make something of it. He's so small, he's ducking under. I mean, he made two or three breaks where he made seven or eight yards when you thought he'd gone blind and there was no other option but he still makes something of it. He backs himself. He's yeah. worth. We said he's worth two. He's worth two penalties for high tackles every game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because he's he's got good footwork, and then people are just trying to react, and they're going to clip him in the head because he's so short. Yeah. <coughs> it was good, man. It was good because the zebra game the previous week, like I was excited to see Jack O'Sullivan and to see Craig getting a shot, mm. but Munster didn't play very well, so they didn't really get to shine in the game, and Craig hurt his hand in the match. But I thought I thought Craig was excellent. I thought I thought Jack O'Sullivan's the the quality of his of his moments were really really good. Like there's a lot of focus around the likes of Baird and the likes of Doris and Deegan, but Jack O'Sullivan has all the ability that those guys have. Like he just probably lost a year through his ACL, hmm. and he just needs to get as much. He needs when he gets opportunities, he needs to take them. And I think probably you know. He probably no one really stood out for Munster in the in the zebra away game. Probably JJ and Fanin. After that, then some of the replacements: Kevin O'Byrne, Jeremy Lockman. But after that, no one else really stood up. But I thought uh, I thought I thought Jack was really good at the weekend. I thought Craig was really good. Um, a lot of good things to take out of it, like you know, because it was it was it was, the game was brutal from the from with the conditions. I just saying like everyone is looking at Niall Scannell. And kind of going like you know, he's he's been harsh done harshly done by now for the for the for the national side selection wise because he's such a good scrummager and um, but 
I think there's you know there's good competition there at Hooker now at Munster as well. You know, like Kevin O'Byrne is probably not physically as dominant as uh, as Scannell, but like his the little bits of football, like playing the little tip ons, dropping the ball back off on the inside, and he had he had a phenomenal piece of skill for uh, Sweetenham's try mm. in uh, in Zebra yeah. the previous week. So I thought Munster it was it was a good good performance to get to get a result there. And did you make the point about Gavin Coombs how effective he was when he came on? Uh -huh. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. He's a, he's a strong boy. He's a bit of a beast. Um, Ulster obviously didn't have a game. Uh, there are reports in South Africa that Marcel <coughs> Koetze. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you, Koetze. That's all I remember. Good to see you, Koetze. Uh, is uh, maybe looking to, to head so. home. You don't think so? Well, he's, he signed up for two more years. All right. <laughs> uh, but that's what that, I know there was some chat there today, but... yeah. Uh, so the Blue Bulls have signed um, Vermeulen. Vermeulen and they're trying to get back um, the centre, Jesse Creel mm. as well and uh, Kutsia. I don't know about Creel but... That Rassi reaching out you reckon trying to get... Trying to get I've, been, what, I've been loving <coughs> his, uh, yeah, his Twitter uh, stuff like man that must like obviously everyone knew how effective he was as a coach and how he, everyone kind of Praises him that's worked with him, but fuck, that must have been so interesting. To it. Would you have had presentations like that? Yeah, yeah, he'd. Uh, well, all, all coaches do that, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, all coaches do that, and and it's a skill set of Rassies. It's the one that, like, I was a dickhead when I was a Springbok, and how he breaks that down, how he talks about when you start out, you're uh, you're desperate to become a Springbok, mm. you're desperate to become a professional rugby player. Then you get it, and uh, and and it becomes incredible, and you're you're delighted. But then you you get the big contract, and then eventually it kind of seems like every rugby player will become entitled at some point, and uh, they become a dickhead, and it's you are up to the people around him to tell him that he's being a dickhead, and uh, that you, you like I was a dickhead, I was an asshole for two years, and it was my play eventually players said it to me, and my, mm. I'm not talking about me. <laughs> That's always happened. Uh, but he said his his wife told him, his family told him, and then he and then it clicked, and he went back to to being himself. Um, that was that's magic, like. Yeah, it's just good skill to just be able to empathise because a lot of things are just they're just normal. It's just a normal cycle that people go through in life, yeah. and he's just calling it out and saying, "Listen, I said I went through it, and probably some of you lads <coughs> are going to go through it as well." But I think um, it's like. All coaches, all coaches do that. It's like because Rassi's won the World Cup now. There's a certain, you know, yeah, there's, a, yeah. there's a real aura around what he's saying. Which is, you know, he's it's a real skill that he has. Imagine your wife took you aside and said, "Listen, Barry, you've been a dickhead for a while." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you too? You've been a dickhead. <laughs> yeah, I'd struggle, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean, Anna? It, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> You're entitled. Um, yeah, look, I just there was parts of it that uh, was the latest, the, or the latest one he put up last night was, um, what was it yesterday? What sacrifice? Sacrifice. Yeah, and when you, uh, when you stop putting yourself in that battle on the pitch, um, that's when you know you're off. That kind of stuff. Mm. Um, yeah, it seems like. That that mindset is what got them to to win the World Cup, you know. That's that's, that's what South Africans are like, man. Really? South Africans are just so uh, they're they're hard, you know. They're hard. They're a hard nation. Do you not agree, Trimby? Yeah, absolutely. They're hard, and they're they have they have you know they want the, the majority any South Africans I've come across want to get better they want to improve they, they just love that that they love the collision mm, like it's Percy is a, per, a, a great example of it he just loves it mm. cannot wait to climb into someone the smash the smash boys in defence to carry hard mm. they love it like yeah so I think it's and it's just tapping into that and keeping it going so yeah. I think that you know if, if you if, if what if you know what makes the, the room tick and you can tap into that and, and the people in the room in there trust you and you have a good relationship with them, I think you've, you're, you're halfway there. Mm. Coaches ask a lot of, of players, you know, the, the physical impact that this has on, on players' bodies. And I know you touched on too, 
um, you know, with like the nerve damage in his elbow. Mm. He was lifted off the restart and then whatever the, the lifter kind of clattered into the winger and he fell and, and wrecked his, um, fractured his elbow or dislocated his elbow. And then his, his hand was kind of facing the other way and then he's got like lasting nerve damage. Mm. You know, that was his ninth surgery, I think he said, in the statement. The statement was hilarious, by the mm. way. Couldn't wipe his, his baby's ass because he's yeah. getting shit all over his hands because he couldn't use his hand properly because like, it's such nerve damage. And yeah, did he wipe his own ass? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you have to hold the baby and, and wipe oh, yeah, it yeah. with your own ass. It's just... You can hold his baby's ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. It just becomes a little bit more real then. Like, yes, you know, exactly, like, yeah. You know, you're not just a commodity, which is, or you are just a commodity yeah. um, at the end of the day. And yeah, it's such a balance to write, to, to be able to talk like that, like Rassi is, and, and get that passion on board. But then at the end of the day, it's it's becoming, a, it, it is a business and it's a commodity. Like even with Sky Sports coming in and potentially taking the Six Nations away from free to air TV, there's a lot of uproar over that at the moment, like where it's like, it's, it's bringing the game the further step away from being the game, like cause a lot of what Dan Tui said was how he hates the way the game has gone, it's yeah. lost all its value. It, because it's a business, not a game anymore, mm. and, bec and because then they were starving um, uh, the championship of finance and then guys are playing for not that much money, and but they're being asked to put their bodies on the line. Mm. Um, I get, I, I, I think he's got a very good point there. He does. And you Especially come out whenever, uh, whenever South Africa showed that the way to win a World Cup is to be unbelievably physical. Hmm. So if that's what you're asking of guys, then I think you need to be aware of the impact that that has hmm. or could potentially have. Tui had nine surgeries. I had, I think I had 12 surgeries. Hmm. You know, and I, I'm, I'm lucky I haven't, haven't got too many, too many issues. Started CrossFit there last week, actually. Ah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, wrists and back and we, all. Do we get into, is he into that? Yeah. Man, yeah. How are you feeling? Um, fine. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Touch wood. I feel grand. I'm just gonna do it for a month. Yeah. See how my back feels because it was my, I had that operation on my back a year and a half ago. Just gonna see how it goes. But it feels mm -hmm. fine so far. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm I'm loving it, but I'm the same. I. What I haven't counted, but I had ten plus surgeries like on my on my ankles and. Uh, I've just. I, feel, I, can't, I can't really do the CrossFit properly. I'm feeling sore, I'm feeling broken. I know it's very technical and it's probably a bad comparison because uh, you're f fucking yourself by doing very technical movements under serious duress as well. So it'll take time, but I'm from my elbows, my shoulders and stuff are I'm yeah. aching. Like, um, and I, I feel like I retired early enough, but if you're going to 35 and battering yourself. Yeah. Um, and, it, and as you said, guys in the championship who are now having their wages slashed and, and having to go out and do that. Yeah, I don't think, I remember sitting on the bus um, before the World Cup in 2011. Uh, what, what was it, the one, or 2015 maybe? Um, whenever uh, Tommy O'Donnell got his hip uh, dislocated. Was, uh, yeah, 2015. 2015, yeah. In the, in, against Wales, Wales yeah. pre-season friendly. Hip dislocated, that's a car crash. Mm. Mm. I remember <coughs> sitting, uh, me and Zebo were sitting behind Tommy and we're like, our, no, we weren't actually, we were talking about him, sorry. And then someone said he's in a bad way, like hip, hip dislocation. Mm. And then uh, Zeeb says, like, we don't get paid enough for this kind of stuff. Mm. You know, and like, you make that, it's fair enough. I think that's a good point. But it's not sustainable, obviously, if wages continue to go up. But I think the style of the game has to change because if the style of the game continues to go towards be more physical, be faster, be more powerful, win more collisions, then guys will pick up more and more injuries and it's less sustainable. Mm. You know, you could injure your hip playing for your club as well, just for your amateur club. Way less likely, way less likely. There's nowhere near the same level <coughs> of athleticism playing for Korean. Although I did, I was wrecked. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, it's a fair point. Like um, you're putting yourself in there. I mean, there's a lot of people who say it's a tough job, it's tough going. But I mean, the, at the end of the day, when you're the money is good when you get to the become a professional rugby player in Ireland. Um, you know, you're only going to be contract within the four provinces and the money is, is good, essentially, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you, I, d I never came out of it going, uh, I was robbed or whatever. No, 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 I'm not. Like, and, and, and most, I think most people who play rugby don't necessarily play for money. Like, it, that's not the, the massive incentive. Yeah. It, 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 it's certainly one of the incentives, but I think guys who play rugby love the game and have grown up playing the game. Mm. 
Do you think it's a fight that he's fighting a losing battle when you start talking like that and that the game it's you know it's it, we've lost all the traditions of it or we've um, it, is it a is it a kind of classically when a fella comes out of a game like that and he may have not have his career may not have gone the way he wanted it to go because he obviously had some regrets talking about not playing for Ireland and maybe not uh, uh, I don't know he said kind of when he went to Irish camp he didn't. Uh, give as much as he thought he should have and stuff like that. He might have a lot of regrets and now he's come out of the game and he's just like shitting on it a little bit. Um, but no, but he balanced it up though and he said, um, to be fair, like, rugby's given me great opportunities and the values that I you know, identify with in rugby that, that I love, that's why I fell in love with the game. Uh, it's important that we kind of maintain those and not let you know all this kind of, all the business of rugby kind of hmm. um, overshadow that. So he was saying Robbie's given him so much. I think mm. he was very he acknowledged okay, that, yeah. that he was he was quite balanced. I thought, um, but yeah, I think he talked about how he got did he get twelve, fifteen caps, something like that, mm. and he regrets not kicking on and get twenty, thirty caps. Mm. He felt like two. He was incredible for for a two or three year period. He was brilliant for Ulster, mm. on and off the pitch, brilliant. He was a great lad. Was he? Yeah. He still is he a is. great lad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, despite his nerve damage, yeah, he's he's a, he's a great Still lad. Shake his hand. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, he was always the one at the back of the bus. He was holding court. He was like, real. He was he was dominating people, telling stories, slagging people, doing impressions. Yeah. He was the heart and soul of Ulster for for a period of time. Then he had to move on. Yeah. How hard is uh too ha hard a handshake? Uh, <laughs> Guy shook my hand the other day. And he tried to break my hand by shaking it, and and I'm I'm afraid. That's too hard. I'm afraid to meet him again. Like, what is the? F did he get right in, or did he grab your fingers? He he got right in and like squished. Well, that's something, I suppose. But you know the way you hear like, oh, there's a good handshake, good strong handshake is so important, and it tells a lot about a person. It's like, well, that tells me that you've read something that said you should squeeze someone's hand to show them that you're a really <laughs> good person, <laughs> which means that I don't like you. Uh, so. Note to all our penguins. Um, just oh, they've got a little flap. <laughs> <laughs> they just flap them back and forth. Uh, penguin of the week, actually. We have a shout out to penguin of the week. Have we got um, one? I don't know. Do you? Have no, one? I haven't been keeping up my New Year's resolution. Ah, deleted Facebook from Pat, my phone. Pat, anyone? Anyone? There was. I'm trying to think of one. We definitely retweeted it. There was a. Uh, <coughs> A lovely, someone did a sketch of penguins. Oh, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I forgot about that. that. Yeah. That was amazing. Did you see that? McKnight? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> I'll go and have a look at it. Because I, you know, I retweeted it anyway. So. Yeah. yeah, the penguins were like lifting another penguin in the line out, which would be really tricky. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah. flippers would be just like slipping up the penguins. Oh, back. you're right. Yeah, Matt McKnight. Yeah. Matt McKnight. Has he got good? The flippers got little suckers on them. No? <laughs> no. no. Definitely don't. Sorry. I didn't think of an octopus. Uh, okay, Mac 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 McKnight. Matt McKnight. Yeah. Mac Mac McMite. <laughs> yep. Jesus. Mike uh, the Knight. Uh, Mac Matt McKnight, you are one hundred percent penguin of the week. One and a great talented boy. Mm -hmm. um, Keep him coming. We're gonna take a break for a few minutes. Um, Pat, you caught up with Irish women's player Emer Considine uh, about her role in Tackle Your Feelings campaign last week. And uh, yeah, we've got a little five minute clip of the two E chatting. Just wanted to go back before we look forward and, and, and even go back into a bit of your past as well. Last time you were on with us, myself and Trimby and House of Rugby, uh, there's a good story you told after we had finished. Um, it was about going back and playing Ga for your, your home, hometown team as well. Um, it's something like the, the idea of like maybe I think you guys had to do a long trip back and forth just to play as well, but it's still something that you love to do when you get a chance, isn't it? Yeah, like I didn't plan on playing football at all this year, but I just, I actually ended up coming home from a holiday early and being home in time for like two weeks of championship. And sure, when you're at home, you just get roped in to playing. <laughs> yeah. So ended up kind of playing the first game, second game, Interpro started and we had an Interpro game on a Saturday, football game on a Sunday, and then we were in the semi-final and then we were in the final. And I think after I was chatting to you, we won the county final. So oh. first time ever in the history of our club doing it. So um, yeah, it was a great year. I was wrecked. We had just played Ulster the day before in the last Interpro game and then played the county final the next day. So yeah, it was a great, <laughs> great surprise to be able to go back doing it. But you love going back and playing with your local club. 
And was it a thing of you had to kind of hit the road then? Was, was the game against Ulster in Dublin then and you had to head, up, head back home? And, yeah, so that yeah. was up in energy yeah. and then was the girls went out that night, um, celebrations or that night and I was straight back down to Clare. Uh, into the Epsom salt bath and <laughs> ready for the ready for the game the next day. And your sis was over as well, wasn't she? She was back for a little bit for that. So I was it. She was home from Australia for the summer, and a few other girls had just come back for one year. They were like, "We'll give it a lash for one final year." And um, then Ailes was like, "Come on, you'll play as well." So it just was. It looked. It worked out really well that we had a really really strong team this year, and a lot of kind of girls that came back, but also a lot of really good youth coming up as well. Um, so hopefully we can build on that again this year, not that I think I'll have any time to play football this year, um, but hopefully the club can build on that success. And you're doing something that's speaking of making stuff aware, you're here, like tackle your feelings today and there's a, a launch of a new, it's a wellbeing app, or it's, it's a, a kind of a new element, something that they've kind of kicked on and they keep adding to the app as well. Yeah, so the Tackle Your Feelings campaign is just, I suppose, I suppose it's taking control of your well-being and the app is a great way to do it. Um, there, it's, it's really user-friendly and it's, it's not just about having mental health issues, it's about managing yourself and managing life's daily stresses and life's daily struggles that you don't have to be down all the time about it. It's, sometimes it's just about being grateful or it's about mm. there's a gratitude section or sometimes it's about um, you know, people, acknowledging the positive relationships in your life and being able to write down two or three things. There's, there's elements in it where you can log your process and you can log, you know, goals for the week, whether it's, you know, some self-care, whether it's taking time for yourself, whether it's to try and get in some extra mindfulness or some meditation, um, really user-friendly. And it's it's got all the resources in there that if you are having a down day or if you're having a stressful day that you can kind of relate back to it. And it's, like I find that I write a lot of stuff down in notebooks, but then I, I lose those notebooks mm, and I yeah. don't know where did I write it down or I've lists everywhere. But in the app, it allows you to, I suppose everyone has their phone on them 24 seven, like I'm never without my phone. Mm. So it's readily available on your phone. You can take notes, you can make your own journal and it's very personal to you. Um, and, and you can use it anytime that you want. There's a, a nice video that accompanies it as well. There's a nice one as well with James Lowe there last year. Um, but maybe if you could get you maybe to explain a little bit of the story that's behind the video as well. So I suppose the story is about I suppose, a difficult time in my life where my dad passed away and not that it, not how it shaped me as a person, but almost in a way that's like why I'm here. Um, and that I suppose it's just the way that I managed myself and the way that I coped through the relationships that I had and through, uh, through sport. Mm. Um, the relationships in, in my mother and in my family were very close family um, and I suppose she just put a huge importance on sport and I suppose it made you realise that you know an awful thing has happened to us but like we just have to take control of what we can control and what we can control is that we can live our life to the best possible way we can be dedicated and you can train hard and you can you can take that mindset into everything that you do whether it be work school training and I suppose that's why I'm here I suppose it's the message that you can control the controllables and um, yeah, it's, it's controlling the controllables and taking the good out of a bad situation, like being grateful for what we have instead of thinking about what you don't have. You think about how amazing it is to be Lay Rugby for Ireland or how amazing it is to have such a good support network or such amazing friends and family. So um, taking the positives from a, a bad situation. And, and yeah, like your, your father, Cyril, was 14 when you passed away and you, you were on the beach <coughs> when he had, had his heart attack and you mentioned there as well that your brother being in Australia there was a bit of a like a delay before the funeral like even looking back now is it just it's just a fog in a way like can you like, remember back then to that time and what it felt like and yeah like I don't think we realized at the time just how big an ordeal it was I mm. suppose now as an as an adult you're like god it was it was really difficult um and it, like it happened right in front of us and Keith was in Australia so he had to come home and that must have been a difficult like mm. phone call and like you know how long a flight to Australia is you know that it's there's so much that you didn't really think about at the time that right now you're like, God, oh, that must have been really difficult. Um, but I suppose we just got through it and got through it as a family and it was through talking and it was through, I suppose, like I said, through sport that, you know, not that you had to try and keep yourself busy, but it wasn't going to change. It wasn't going to bring him back. Nothing mm. we were going to do was going to bring him back. So we had to focus on what you could change and you could, Mum, I suppose, put that focus on us and us being busy and us being busy in sport and through school and I suppose keeping us focused on things and having a direction in life and having a goal in life and and she did that really really well. Yeah you spoke about your mum there like she, she features or a few lines about her you're saying it's in their line that 
um, I want you to be as good as I think you are. Isn't that the line? She it's, says it all yeah. the time. So before every game, she'll text us, both Eilish and I, because at the moment she's in the middle of her season as well, and it'll be be as good as your mother thinks you are. And you could have had an <laughs> awful game, and she'll be like, no, you did great. I was like, ma'am, I had four knock-ons, and I yeah. was awful. And she'll be like, no, no, no. So that's that's why I say it, because, and that's why she says it, because genuinely, like whatever we do, she thinks we're great, even if we've had an awful game. But I suppose it's great to have someone like that that you can always go back to who thinks that, you know, no matter how bad a game is, she's still going to love us no matter what, so. Okay, thank you very much, Pat. Um, what a terribly sad story, but I suppose the beauty of sport um, for Emer and her, her sister and her mum, I suppose using sport to mm. create a positive um, output for their lives. Um, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, and she was saying her mum is... Uh, just a great, you know, pillar for the whole family. Like, and I think even there last year, the herself, the mo Emer, her mum, and her brother all went over to watch Ailish. They're playing in a grand final there last year. Like, so, um, yeah, what they've gone through and where they are now is kind of a yeah. credit to them and credit to the mum as well. Yeah. Um, obviously, the Emer is not going to be playing this weekend um, mm. with the all the games in Ireland or in Italy being cancelled, but um, we do have to still predict our games for the Guinness Pint predictor or results for the weekend. Uh, Fly didn't do too well last week, unfortunately. No, no, yeah. it sucked. Um, so we'll just get, again explain <coughs> the Guinness Pint predictor is simple to get involved in. Uh, you predict the winner and the margin of the Guinness Six Nations every week and if you're within three points, you win a pint of Guinness and you can gift that pint of Guinness, which some people have very kindly done to us as well. So we're playing throughout the championship. It's not too late to join in. Just download the Match Pint app and join our league with the league code H-O-R-I-E. Okay, and if we do fail uh, every week between the three of us, we have a forfeit. Um, Fla, your forfeit this week is... Pat? Yeah, we were... Um, the folks from RTE were in touch with us there. Um, the current series of Dancing with the Stars is going on at the moment. Oh, right. Um, so Aidan Fogarty, who plays Hurling for Kilkenny, is currently being taught how to do some dance moves by Emma Barkley, yeah. great dancer. And uh, she's willing to kind of give you a few lessons and maybe teach you the tango. Um, so we'll try and set that up for you at some stage this week. And <laughs> is the tango, is that quite a basic starter, starting point? No, not really. It'd be tough enough. Oh, good. Tough enough. <laughs> good. Amazing. Oh, okay. What's her name? Emma Barkley. And, and can we finish with... Um, uh, Me dirty... getting gunged as well or something. <laughs> <like that. laughs> a dirty dancing lift with Emma on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. All right, well, hopefully I don't stamp on this girl's feet and ruin her career. That's that sounds like a threat. <laughs> <laughs> well, Emma, just if you're listening. <laughs> okay. I actually didn't mean it as a threat, but now I'm thinking, oh. That's a wonderful forfeit. Excellent. Okay. Well done, Pat. Uh, okay, for well, we've still got to predict our games for this coming weekend. Uh, so obviously no Ireland versus Italy, but we have Wales versus England and Scotland versus France. Um, let's start with Wales versus England. Trimble. Um It's Twickenham, obviously, isn't it? No. Oh, I mean, obviously. <laughs> I'm obviously joking. <laughs> so I mean, um, uh, still, for me, England by... Um, nine. England by 11. by 11. The forfeits have just gone through the roof here, so mm. the pressure is added. Um, do you do well to stick yourself in between because you'll not be last? England by 10. Okay, then to make it fair, I better go first for the next one and you go last. Okay. Scotland versus France. Do you, do you stick by these? Predictions, by the way, when it comes to... No, I changed them. No, I changed. <laughs> uh, Scotland versus France. I'm going to go France by 14. You're next. Um, the wheels are going to come off. France is... Um, what's a French vehicle? <laughs> Citroen. Citroen. <laughs> Citroen. <laughs> uh, Scotland by three. Wow. Crazy. I don't believe you're going to go with that. Yeah. There's no way you're going to go with that. You haven't got the balls to That's go with that. That's my spoof prediction. Yeah. <laughs> now for the real <laughs> one. I'm going to say France by 12. Mm. Okay. 
All right. Well, look, um, in the meantime, Fly, you get your, your forfeit done and uh, we'll see how those games go. And uh, yeah, let's wrap it up. Thank you to everybody for listening and for all of you watching on YouTube. Hola. Uh, this has been Baz and Andrews, House of Rugby, here on Joe, together with Guinness. Party on. Party on.